Well, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Bill Schullinger. I'm a professor and scientist in the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences at Washington State University, uh, based at the Dryland Research Station at Lind. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking briefly about canola. This is winter canola in wheat-based systems. Uh, by the way, uh, this is not Lind. This is uh, Ritzville uh, on the farm of Ron Dre. Uh, I've had uh, I have three long-term experiments at this site. Uh, the longest is the one I'm standing in now. Uh, that's been we're in our 24th crop year. Uh, lots of information generated from this site. Uh, uh, big plots, as you can see, 500 feet long, 30 feet wide, uh, 56 plots. So we've got a lot of things going on out here. But I'm going to uh, concentrate on winter canola. This is uh, an 11 and a half inch annual precip zone. Uh, uh, it's pretty much a wheat follow cropping system practice out here. Essentially all farmers practice that exclusively, one crop every two years. We're trying to do things uh, a bit uh, differently or try some different things that might, might work for farmers. Uh, so before I go into this, I'd like to talk just uh, very briefly about two other crops uh, that are showing real potential out here. Uh, that I will not be discussing today, but would just like to briefly mention. And one of those is winter pea. And winter pea uh, is uh, been grown out here for, oh, let's say uh, 10 years now, and acreage is increasing. Uh, it's a very easy to grow crop. Uh, it fixes uh, atmospheric nitrogen, so you don't need to apply nitrogen to grow the crop. It doesn't use as much water. Uh, as uh, other crops. It only takes water down to three feet. Uh, it has unsurpassed emergence from deep planting depths. You plant this crop winter pea one time and it will come up from, oh, if you plant it eight inches, no problem, even if you get a crusting rain. Uh, easy to grow, uh, stable yields. We've grown it out here for 10 years. Uh, so uh, uh, the only downside of that is the price is not very good right now, but that, I guess that could change. Uh, the second crop that we've been growing out here for 10 years is winter triticale. And that too has a lot of uh, potential, I believe. Uh, you can grow it just like wheat. Uh, just treat it like wheat and you will produce a nice uh, winter triticale crop. Meanwhile, let's get back to uh, winter canola out here. Uh, this, this is a crop uh, that really has its, has its legs, so to speak. And by that I mean uh, it, it has a support structure built around it. Uh, there's a huge uh, uh, canola crushing plant in Warden, Washington, about 40 miles from here. Uh, that is the largest oilseed crushing plant west of the Rocky Mountains. And so uh, that's the delivery point for canola. And that's, that's for uh, uh, oil, that's used for food oil, biofuel production, and the meal is used as an excellent source of uh, uh, animal feed supplement. So, uh, uh, it's uh, like winter pea or any broadleaf crop, it breaks up wheat-borne diseases in the soil, so that's, uh, that's uh, truly excellent to have. You can control your grass weeds like downy brome or cheatgrass in this crop. Uh, with with a, a number of herbicides will do that. Uh, uh, there's all sorts of varieties uh, produced by both uh, uh, university and private sector uh, uh, people uh, that have all sorts of characteristics. For example, there are many canola varieties that are tolerant of uh, soil-borne herbicides in the soil that have been uh, put there in, the, in wheat production. So uh, this, this does have its legs and farmers can make money with this crop. Uh, it's not unreasonable out here at, at this location uh, to expect uh, on winter canola a 2,500 pound crop of canola. Well, at today's price of about 15 cents, 2,500 pounds, that's worth $375. To reach that same gross income with winter wheat, which again, that is the king crop out here by far, you'd need 75 bushels at $5.50 a bushel. So, uh, not that we can't grow 75 bushel wheat out here too, we, we can at this site, but uh, uh, canola uh, can do really well and you can make some money. Okay, with that said, uh, what are the difficulties 
of growing this crop? Well, by far, by far, the biggest difficulty uh, of growing this crop is getting a stand establishment. Canola has a very small seed. Uh, and again, this is wheat follow country. Uh, farmers are used to planting their wheat uh, oh, five inches down into moisture and having it come up through uh, four inches of dry soil. Uh, and that works uh, very successfully with winter wheat or winter triticale, uh, but uh, not so much with winter canola. Not that it can't do it. I've had it do it and other farmers had too, but that's a struggle. And also winter canola does not like uh, emerging uh, through uh, a, a big long layer and then at the, at the top of the soil, uh, it's often 20 degrees warmer than it is air temperature. And so that cotyledon leaf can just get fried as it's emerging. So you will have some stand failures planting winter canola deep into fallow. What I think might be the safest strategy and has worked for me is to plant, uh, is to just practice chemical or chem fallow, uh, no-till fallow, don't do any tillage during your fallow. And uh, certainly the, the soil surface will dry down uh, quite substantially during, during the uh, summer, hot, dry summer months. But uh, if we catch uh, one of these August or early September rainstorms, that will wet right, right up and making it uh, quite uh, uh, easy or feasible to get a, a stand of canola. What's the chance of getting a rain like that? Well, I've gone through long-term uh, weather data from a hundred years, really solid weather data from the Lynn Station, located well, again 15 miles from here. But uh, the likelihood of getting a half an inch of rain in any two day period between August 1 and September 15th is 22 percent. 22 percent. So if that happens, and you have some chem follow, that will, that's enough, and we know that, we've measured that, that's enough to wet through the dry layer, and you can come out here and plant uh, winter canola, you know, one, one and a half inches deep into newly wet soil, and have an a excellent chance of getting uh, a stand of winter canola. And that's exactly what we did with this crop last year. Uh, we had a little over half an inch of rain on September uh, 7th, we planted this on September 9th. So in that sense, winter canola is an opportunity crop for farmers. You don't plan on planting it every year. You can't just fit it into your rotation and saying that, you know, that year I'm going to plant winter canola. And uh, you just, if you have to wait for your opportunity, I feel, and then plant when you have a very good chance of getting plant establishment, and especially after a new rain. So uh, this, uh, out here, we're comparing three three-year rotations, and those rotations are winter canola, spring wheat, follow, winter wheat, spring wheat, follow, and winter triticale, spring wheat, follow. And so we're comparing all, all of those phases of the rotation are present every year out here, so we're getting data every year. So right now I'd like to focus just on two data slides to show you some things that are happening out here with that, with those three rotations. Uh, now this first slide we see overwinter water gain on the uh, left-hand axis and underneath uh, is uh, years. Uh, and you can see that those bars, those three colored bars represent can, uh, canola, winter triticale, and winter wheat. And I say, I say uh, canola instead of uh, winter canola because, again, this is an opportunity crop. We're not able to plant winter canola here every year, and when we're not, we need to have canola in the plots for the rotations, but uh, we'll often plant spring canola. Uh, you probably don't want to plant spring canola out here uh, because it will not do as well as winter canola. Winter canola is the, the canola crop to grow. But you see the three bars there. Those bars represent overwinter water gain in the soil. And if you look at 2017, you'll see that canola stubble only stored about half the amount of overwinter precip in the soil as did uh, both winter triticale stubble and uh, winter wheat. Well, um, 
And, and that, that is not a, that's, that's true, those are true data. We did store up to 10 inches of water or more uh, out, out here that year. That was a very wet year. Uh, th that was a 17 inch precip year for, for this site. So uh, we're pretty good out here in the PNW about storing over winter precip. So uh, what, uh, I, I won't, we have some theories about what might've happened. I don't have time to address that. You go to 2008 and you can see the same thing. Uh, sort of happened. Uh, winter, winter, uh, the canola stubble was low. Uh, but you go to 2019, we really didn't measure much difference. And then here again in 2020 in the spring, this is measured in uh, early April uh, each year. Uh, some difference, but not anything too overwhelming. However, the four-year average, we do have a significant decline in winter, uh, uh, over winter storage in, in uh, canola stubble versus uh, wheat or triticale stubble. Now if you go to the top, those numbers where you see it says spring wheat grain yield, uh, bushel per acre, that's the spring wheat yield. Again, these are all, uh, spring wheat follows all of these crops. Those are the spring wheat uh, yields we got, uh, obtained those years. And you can see that first year, 2017, uh, with, all the, with the significantly less water, uh, much, much less uh, grain yield uh, with after canola than the other crops. And the same thing uh, occurred in 2018. Now 2019, where we did not have differences in uh, significant, or significant differences in water, uh, no significant di uh, differences in yield. But if you look at the three-year average on the far right, and the reason that's a three-year instead of a four-year is we haven't yet harvested this spring wheat, uh, we are seeing a big decline in yields after spring wheat. Well. Why is it? Is it water? So I'm showing this second slide, which shows uh, the relationship of grain yield with spring wheat yields uh, as related to soil water content in, in late March. And yes, there is a relationship, but it certainly isn't a one-to-one -one relationship. It's uh, that R squared, uh, 0 0.33, that means uh, one third of the yield differences can be accounted for by this spring water content differences. And yes, that is significant, but that's only one third. So that means two thirds of the yield differences that we're seeing are due to something else. So, uh, I, we've been working with canola and wheat-based rotations for, for a number of years. And we had a six year study up at Davenport uh, on the Hal Johnson farm where we looked at uh, winter canola and winter wheat uh, uh, and their effect on subsequent spring wheat. And over the course of those six years, we found a 17% decline in spring wheat yield, a highly significant decline in spring wheat yield following uh, winter canola versus winter wheat. And we could not figure out why that happened because there was no difference in overwinter water storage. Uh, the differences that we've seen here on those certain years that I just pointed out, we never saw at Davenport. Uh, there was no, uh, we measured a lot of agronomic factors, weeds, uh, soil borne diseases. There were no diseases. Uh, there were essentially no weeds. Hal's an excellent farmer. So we said, what is this that's causing this uh, yield decline? Well, fortunately, we took soil samples through the years, and uh, Jeremy Hansen uh, did his uh, PhD soils uh, dissertation on those samples, which was to look at soil micro, my, uh, microbial activity uh, as affected by canola and wheat. And, and what Jeremy found, and he found a lot of things, and, and he's published a lot of information, is that uh, so soil microbial communities decline, both the bacterial and fungal communities decline uh, with introducing canola into wheat-based rotations. Well, uh, okay, uh, and, and one important fun fungi that is reduced is uh, mycorrhizal fungi, and those are really important fungi. Uh, they are uh, basically hyphal strands that grow in symbiosis with roots uh, on uh, most plants. They don't, uh, canola is not a host of uh, 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 mycorrhizae, so they don't grow on uh, brassica plants like camelina and, and canola. So 
uh, they're, they're very important. They grow out and they, extend, they expand the surface area available for uh, nutrient acquisition and, and what have you, a lot of different soil health functions. So whatever the reason, Jeremy found uh, lots of differences in soil micro, uh, uh, microbial activity following winter canola, and that carried over to the next spring crop. And that spring crop was planted eight months after that winter canola or winter wheat harvest. Uh, but, but on the positive side, if you extended that follow further in the years where we did not, we had some, some areas where, that were not planted back into spring wheat but went through a full follow cycle, things more or less got back into equilibrium. So out here in the winter wheat follow country, where not that much spring wheat has grown, there's been no, uh, no reports of yield decline uh, of wheat uh, after canola with a year follow in between. On the contrary, there's reports of up to 20% uh, increase in wheat yield. And that's supported by research uh, uh, in both uh, Australia and the United States as well. So uh, we, we, don't, we wouldn't have that out here. It doesn't appear. It, things just sort of get back into a equilibrium if you take the follow a little bit further. So uh, with that in mind, I'd like to show you some things that I think are, are, are cool um, and important that we're doing out here uh, in these studies on our follow-up with the spring wheat after these three crops, winter canola, uh, winter triticale, and, and winter wheat. Okay, what you, what you see uh, behind me here are uh, studies that uh, Jeremy Hansen is doing. And, and what we've d done here, or what Jeremy has done, is, is since we have seen the decline in mycorrhizae fungi following canola, Jeremy has put out these uh, microplots in all of the spring wheat treatments out here to see what the effect would be of adding mycorrhizae inoculum during the spring wheat year. And it's a little bit hard to see here, but this is planted in, spring, in, in paired rows. Uh, you know, these rows are four inches apart, and then we put the fertilizer down the middle. Well, what Jeremy did was he came out uh, right out after this uh, had emerged, this uh, spring wheat, and he just uh, dug a little trench and in injected mycorrhizal fungi in this side, and then that side is the control. And so we're trying to get a handle on saying, well, if we do have this decline, and if you want to follow uh, brassica with uh, a crop thereafter, could we in, you know, add microbial uh, fungi, which could be done to the seed, by the way, and, uh, and just eliminate that, that problem. And another thing that's going on out here, which is equally important, is work with Tim Pollitz with uh, uh, ARS, who's a long-term colleague of mine, uh, and he's coming out. Uh, matter of fact, uh, today's May 18th. He's going to be out here the 21st, and he's going to be sampling spring wheat roots and uh, rhizosphere soil. Uh, rhizosphere soil is the soil that actually adheres to the roots. Uh, and he's going to be using that to do both, uh, uh, D well, he's going to be doing DNA sequencing uh, for both, uh, oh, many, uh, numerous taxa of fun fungi and uh, bacteria. Uh, and this technology, the DNA sequencing, is sequencing is relatively modern, uh, very high-tech uh, 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 technology. Uh, but uh, we're going to learn, I think, quite a bit about that. So both uh, Jeremy and uh, and uh, and Tim will be out here working on that. So uh, with that, uh, again, we have a lot of things going on out here. Uh, that's just a brief snapshot of what's uh, going on out here in our canola-based rotation. So thanks for joining me today.